we are back on it's always game day in cincinnati lindsey patterson mike santagata mike what's up hitting the five day weekend it's a rare it's a rare occurrence but it's wonderful because i usually work well my day job and this mm -hmm. uh i won't be doing this over the weekend but nope. day job is four four ten hour shifts so monday through thursday and then next week we get tuesday off so i am not going to work monday instead we'll work friday so we get tuesday wednesday thursday friday that's so worth it five day weekend oh man yeah it's it's cool i love it see i i took tomorrow off you know mm -hmm. i went to taylor mm -hmm. swift when this comes right. out it's taylor swift day and i'm really excited i am a swift and five fan. guys oh i mean i'm not go i'm going to sacred beast <laughs> and otr you ever heard of sacred oh, okay. beast i have not even heard of it no Okay, well, I'm going there because the downtown's going to be absolutely insane tomorrow. So I'm going there first and then I'm going to go to the concert. But um, I'm taking, I have a four day week. I normally, I work in the corporate world too. And I have five, I normally work Monday through Friday. And I said, you know what? We're going to take Friday off. And now I'm extremely jealous of you because you work four days a week. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> I, I mean, my, my last job before this, I did too. It's not something that I like really search for just mm -hmm. luck. So I love it. I'd prefer to work the extra two hours a day to get an entire day off. It's very much worth it. Also, you ever get, I'm basically in charge of what days I work as long as I do work four days. So if I ever get sick on like Wednesday or I just really don't feel good, I just work Friday, <laughs> take that day off. I don't need to work through the sickness, which is pretty cool. I am, yeah, I'm extremely, extremely jealous. Now I have to figure out how to do the four day work week because this is, this is balance. This is work and life balance having that. So no, it, it'll be, uh, it'll be really nice and enjoy your five day weekend. That's awesome. Before you get really busy and we get into the thick of football season, the training camp, the preseason, regular season, all of that. Yeah. You're not, you're not I, I mean, I'm not ready. Regular season is really when the grind starts, but it's also very exciting at the start. I, I feel like there's just that feeling of like football's back. I know you got that weekend of college football, but I, I just don't really care about college football. I will watch a game that weekend though, just because mm -hmm. I'm excited. And then I'll complain about, which I think this rule got changed. I'll complain in my house about <laughs> why does the clock stop for every first down? Like this game is dragged out so long. And then uh, I think they changed that though. I think, I think, it's no longer every first down stops the clock because that's always dragged the game out. Like those games are like four plus hours. They are. They're so long. I, I, I'm okay with college football. The thing I love about college football, I'll tell you this. I love Saturdays in September and October. And you could even say November. There's a chill in the air. You have football playing. Um, I, I don't have a favorite college football team. So that's probably the reason why I'm not huge college football Saturdays. Yeah. But, same. You know, I'll have it on watch the game, tell you what happened if there's some cool games, but NFL Sunday is, is number one. It's where it's at. And that's what I look forward to. And I won't be surprised if NFL games start to peak more and more into those Saturdays um, and just say, Hey, you know what? We're trying to be five days a week kind of thing. Because well, they keep talking about like Wednesday and Friday. It's like, Oh goodness. Well, they have a Friday this year. You yep, know? They sure so, do. I mean, Bengals wanted it, but the NFL said, you know what? You're too eager to have that Friday game. We're going to give it to someone else like the Jets. You got to play. Yeah, it's – it's. Oh, wait, hold on. Nick said something for – this is, I think, just for me and my take about the college football thing. Co the clock will stop in the final two minutes of each half or, for first down still. I don't like it. There's such a frantic chaos energy for an NFL two-minute drill that college just doesn't replicate because once they get that first down, they just kind of like slowly come up. They got mm -hmm. guys with the signs – <laughs> it's like they don't the yeah. nfl and I, I mean college quarterbacks not the same level so like nfl quarterbacks they come and just rub two fingers they got a whole play call in there but uh i love that i love nfl two minute drills so much and the college ones are fine i just feel like it's missing the complete chaos element of it yeah i see it um you know what we're, we're gonna move on to some other things because this was a topic on our podcast a couple weeks ago carlos dunlap we talked yep. about, you know, we, we a couple players. What are the odds this player could come back and play for the Cincinnati Bengals? Carlos Dunlap was on the list. Tyler Eifert was on the list. Eli Apple, and I'm forgetting all oh, Mohamed Sanu. Mohamed Sanu, yeah. And uh, Carlos Dunlap made his way back in town. He has a restaurant. I want to say that there's I, – I think the title is Honey is his restaurant. Honey something. Honey something. 
Um, we're great marketing over here. Hey, no free ads on the podcast. I will look it up just so that he does just get so it proper. Get, just so yeah. we do give the right restaurant name. But you can continue while I do that. Yeah, so it's over in the Covington side. I actually, I was walking to something in Covington a couple weeks ago, and I thought, you know what? No way, that's Carlos Dunlap's restaurant, and it was. So they had the opening, and big deal, Carlos Dunlap is back in Cincinnati. There's a couple things. There's a couple pictures of Carlos Dunlap, and he's wearing that really big, shiny ring, uh, Super Bowl ring with the Kansas City Chiefs. And I think one of the photos that came out today, Ben Baby, over on Twitter, um, had Katie Blackburn look like uh, Katie Blackburn. Some of the front office went over to mm-hmm. support Carlos Dunlap. And again, that just, I, I kind of mentioned it on the last podcast. I was like, oh man, I could never see them kind of reuniting. I felt like it's kind of a little, how it went down. It felt like bad blood, but Hey, there's so much more that happens behind the scenes. And I'll say one thing about the Brown family and, and Blackburn, they have a lot of respect for their players, um, who come and go. And they remember you. So maybe, you know, that I, I don't know. I felt like that was really cool for Katie Blackburn to go out there and support Carlos Dunlap um, opening his restaurant. Honey uninhibited. That's what it was. Yeah. Uh, but yes, and Katie Blackburn's huge because ownership and mm-hmm. everything. It's not Mike Brown, but, you know. Yeah. Mike, Mike Brown, I feel like, doesn't take that many pictures <laughs> right now. Uh, but, yeah, that's a good sign for the ownership. The other person that was in that Ben Baby tweet was duke tobin so he does not feel betrayed by the man who traded him although he really wanted traded so (laughs) i also feel like that's probably somebody he's fine with now if we get an image of lou anarumo and carlos dunlap at the restaurant now i'll feel like the comeback might be real but for now i just think they're being nice and whatnot i just it's glad they don't there's no real animosity with ownership in dunlap Mm -hmm. because Carlos Dunlap should 100% make the ring of honor. He has the, what is it, tied for the most sacks all time? Could you imagine not putting that guy in because in his 10th year or whatever, he had a, a, an issue with ownership? It's like, it happens, man. Like, Corey Dillon didn't, when he, I was young, but when he mm-hmm. left, wasn't wasn't it not on amicable terms? Yeah, he was pretty upset. He threw he threw his cleat in the stadium, and he said that he would rather flip burgers. Okay, yeah. So we're jonesing to add him back in, right into the Ring of Honor, but Carlos Carlos Dunlap was kind of like his 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 exit kind of felt like that too. Honestly. It was, yeah, it was. So I mean, time heals all wounds, and they're not going to put in the new people in just yet. It's not going to be this year or anything. But when the opportunity rises, I feel like he is a Ring of Honor type players so i'm glad that ownership seems to have squashed the beef a little bit and maybe by then you know the defensive coordinator won't have too much beef (laughs) with them because that was the real issue i think and maybe the head coach a little bit but it felt we'll just say the coaching staff yeah i mean that that is a big deal and i think that and we don't know anything about behind the scenes how lou Mm -hmm. felt or you know now down years down the road you know years have passed and and things like that how, how does the coaching staff feel? We just don't know. I just feel like if Carlos Dunlap does play in 2023, I just don't, I don't think it's going to be in Cincinnati. Um, no, probably not. But hey, the dream is alive. It is alive. I mean, his restaurant is right across the river, um, which is awesome. Good for Carlos. Um, you know, I know how things went down and we've talked about it plenty, but he did good things off the field uh, when he was in Cincinnati and then obviously on the field when he was here. There's another person I want to talk about, PFF. Not That's gonna not get it. There's someone behind. There's someone behind. The <laughs> Chris Collinsworth, future Ring Chris, of Honor member. <laughs> Chris Collinsworth. No, 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 no. Nothing against him. Believe me, I know how Bengals fans feel about him. It's a. It was a PFF tweet. I, I called them one person. I know there's more than one <laughs> one person who works at PFF, and it was Tampa Trey, who's over there. I want to say he's he's been there for like maybe the last year. I could be wrong. Sikema. Great. I could not remember his last name. I'm obviously terrible with names on this podcast today, so I apologize in advance, but they call him Tampa Trey over on Twitter. And uh, one of the things I'm going to say this about PFF, and it's extremely smart to do. They put out a lot of clickbait, a lot of a lot of their quotes, a lot of their retweets, a lot of your likes. um, Is I mean, they did a thing with uh, Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey, the best duo in the NFL the funniest ones are like who's stopping this offense and it's like the new york giants like daniel jones wandale robinson it's like probably most teams i I don't understand this 
every day. I mean, smart. If you're the social media manager, you're like, you know what? Let's put something a little, little, little you know, we know it's going to get a pretty good reaction. We're going to put it on our Twitter account. We're going to get great views, interactions. People are going to comment because people love the NFL and they want their team to be talked about. Uh, there was one thing, and it's probably going to go into our next segment, but I want to bring it up because it's something that I've honestly noticed for the last couple of years. I don't know how much awards mean to players when it comes to NFL awards, but you look a couple of years ago when Joe Burrow won Comeback Player of the Year, uh, Jamar Chase won Rookie of the Year. It was really cool. They were given those awards when they were at the Super Bowl, you know, a couple nights before the, the big game. And for them to have that after what happened to Joe in his rookie year was pretty incredible. Um, you know, there's a lot of deserving players for that. Coach of the Year has been something that I felt like Zach Taylor is being – a little, a little slept on when it comes to the other coaches who are getting that recognition recognition. And I think a lot of people would look at if I, if I were to say Zach Taylor deserved to be in that conversation last year, they would say, well, he just went to the Super Bowl. Um, you know, it's not really taking a team from not being that great to going to an AFC championship game again, but it was like, they didn't really talk about him the year previously either from taking a team and Joe Burrow being injured and coming off of that and then being able to put a team in the Super Bowl was extremely huge winning a playoff game and it just feels like we're, we'll get to what the the ranking and the list look like but just overall with Zach Taylor what is it about him that people just they're like eh, it's it's Joe Burrow it's Jamar Chase it's T Higgins just shouldn't Zach Taylor get some credit for something okay I, I've got a few takes one and we'll just start with why Zach Taylor doesn't get as much credit as he should because he started off bad. So people had their opinion mm -hmm. and they didn't think he could get better. They just saw that oh, he's a bad coach. And like, I'm not going to say he was a bad coach, but I will say the results weren't good and it made sense to kind of blame him. Weird. Yeah. Louis Anarumo also started off pretty shaky and everybody's turned on him. They think he's one of the greats, but with Zach Taylor, his results didn't turn until he got the players. And I think that you can look independent of the players and see that he's putting his players in a better position to succeed than he ever has. Mm -hmm. uh, he's gotten better every year, but it really felt like a lot of the national media kind of made up their mind by year two. They're like, Oh, he's not good. Let's move on and start looking at other guys. Um, my second take coach of the year. How much of a chance does Zach Taylor ever have to win that? Because what it really is, is most improved team. Like that's, what did it if you're a bad team and you go nine and eight, ten and seven and squeak into the playoffs, you're winning coach of the year. Look at Brian Dabble. I mean, like, yeah. did they were they a Super Bowl contender? No. Did they squeak into the playoffs, win just enough games? Yeah. Did, is there some way you could give him a lot of credit for that? Yeah. So floor raising has been such a big thing for coach of the year talk. Nobody cares about your ceiling. They just care that you took a bad team and made them good. I think of back. But Marvin Lewis won it in, was that 20, somewhere in that 2011 to 2013 range, I think. I can't remember. I but can't he won it. And the reason he won was because people thought the team was going to be bad and they were good and they made the playoffs or won the division, one of the two. Well, they would have made the playoffs, they won the division, but like they may mm -hmm. have won a wild card spot or won the division. Uh, yeah. I mean, these are just, I, I don't, I don't personally agree with that ideology. It was 2009, that's right, because that was a really wild year that they made the playoffs because they just stunk in 2008. They uh, swept their division, too. I think they won mm -hmm. every game. They won the division. It was That was that was a big one. It was not 2011-2015. It was that random 09 year, which I love that year. Which uh, random year? Because the following year, Carson, after that season, he won a traded. So that's why. Yeah, I the next year was the T.O. show. T.O. show. But uh, I still have a shirt. But... Um, yeah, I, I don't personally fully agree with the idea that it's just your floor raising is what matters. I, mm -hmm. I feel like Andy Reid should have – you know Kyle Shanahan doesn't have a single Coach of the Year award? It's like he probably should have one, right? I mean, yeah. I, I'm going to get into – there's more I want to get into with this list. We will get to your questions when it comes to the Twitter world, but there's more I want to talk about with Zach Taylor. Look, I don't want to look back and be like, Coach of the Year, let's make it a topic, but it, it's going to connect with what I'm seeing when it comes to Zach Taylor and around the NFL. And I just feel like a lot of people forget 
some of the other things that he's been able to do with this team. Yes, they have Joe Burrow, but then I also hear Joe Burrow isn't good enough or Joe Burrow has all the weapons. That's why they're winning. You know, what is it? What is it? Is It can be more than one thing with this team, and I don't feel like Zach Taylor gets that credit, and I want to get to more of that next because I'm going to ramble more, and we're going to be over in this segment. So we're going to get to that next on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Going to get to your Twitter questions in a moment. You guys were slacking a little bit on getting those Twitter questions over, but hey, you make up for it every other week, and we really appreciate it. Follow along over on Twitter, Bengals underscore Sands. You can follow me at LNDS Patterson. I'm going to continue the Zach Taylor conversation just for a little bit, then we're going to move on to your questions. Uh, We were talking a little bit about the NFL overall when it comes to Zach Taylor. And for me personally, the wins are easy to look at. But I think it's more of the culture and and what has changed over the last few years with Zach Taylor. I mean, you get guys showing up to these OTA offseason programs. They talk about Zach Taylor all the time. Zach Taylor going to the bars after those playoff wins and just being exact, extremely hyped and, and buying into everything that he's, he's bringing to Cincinnati. And uh, I see this list. I'm going to go ahead and get to it. It was PFF, our guy, Tampa Trey. I don't know if he's a friend of the show. Friend of the show. Okay, friend of the show. P- First PFF guy that's a friend of the show. Here we go. Uh, Andy Reid is number one. I have no argument there. It's Andy Reid. Yeah. Just Andy won the Super Bowl. Yeah, number one's fine. Uh, probably some people are like, oh, wait, Bill Belichick has all the Super Bowls. He should be number one. He's number two. Totally fine. No problem with that. Mm-hmm. Honestly, Mike Tomlin, I, mm-hmm. I don't have a problem. He's been able to win with teams that – he doesn't have a whole lot of talent on sometimes, and he's able to get the above 500 record. So, cool. Really like, great floor raiser, and he's won a Super Bowl. So, the ceiling's there, too. Yeah. No no, no problem. Number three. Kyle Shanahan. I mean, it's just for me personally, I'm like, if, if Kyle Shanahan's there, then why isn't Zach Taylor there? I think a lot of what we value coaches are are things that we can measure, and what we can measure with somebody like Kyle Shanahan is his ability to still have a not even just functional but very good offense, even with bad quarterback play, as long as there is a quarterback in the offense. But that's one of the things is we value and measure, you know, how performance happens on the field, but we don't care much about Kyle Shanahan and you know, like benching Brandon Ayuk uh, during parts of uh, what was that two years ago now, and just random. It seems like there's sometimes some player. Not trying to say that there's like, this is a real issue with him, but I just feel like with him rather than Taylor, it feels like it feels like Taylor's more of a player's question. Does that matter? And being the CEO head of the ship, uh, also. Personally, I'm probably going to put most people that have won a Super Bowl over people that did not win the Super Bowl, even though you could argue it's not Kyle's fault that Jimmy Garoppolo did not win that game and he put them in a position to win it. Uh, it, They still didn't win it. So it's just, I mean, it's small sample anecdotal stuff, but it's just, I don't know, like John Harbaugh feels to me like he should be up there. And I I, I can get into more hot takes, but... (laughs) I got Doug Peterson. You well, want to see cool with Nick Foles? We're almost at John Harbaugh. Um, okay. But but kind of back going back with Kyle Shanahan, I should acknowledge what he's been able to do with the quarterback mm-hmm. position. And honestly, I'm still a little bitter. His team dropped the interception when they played the Rams in the NFC Championship. Why, why Shanahan over McVay? McVay won a Super Bowl. They run a similar offense. McVay is able to raise the floor like that. That's just interesting to me. It's just like. I don't know, like McVay won head-to-head in the NFC Championship game two years ago, but we still go with Shanahan as uh, the better of the two coaches. Yeah, I mean, and again, we're, we're going to get to Sean McVay in a second because you get John Harbaugh, which, fine, I don't have a problem with. It's it's whatever, um, and I know they've – I'm, I'm good with him there. Yeah, yeah he won a Super really Bowl. No, no problem at all with John Harbaugh there. I think Sean- he's one of the best at getting his players mentally ready for the game, if that's mm-hmm. like a – I don't know if it's not like a weird take, but just like it it feels like his guys, A, love playing for him, and B, it's some backup and the most important game of their life. And they'll do pretty good. <laughs> just think of like Tyler Huntley. It's like he, he wasn't bad in that game. He was pretty much bad all year. His team, his the fans were so down on Tyler Huntley after that game. <laughs> I was like that poor guy. He had to step up in a moment. I'm like, it wasn't really. You know, it's it was an accident. 
I'm sure he didn't mean to give the ball to Sam Hubbard so he could run 98 yards for a touchdown, but hey, it worked out uh, that way. <laughs> supposed to do that about half yard in, not from three yards out. And you so, see why. My favorite moment, not to go back into that playoff game, but my favorite moment. I'm so sorry, Tyler Huntley. I do kind of feel bad for you, but when he was going touchdown because he touchdown. thought he scored, yeah, I was like, no, you didn't score. You didn't. Uh, but we'll go over to fine top five, no issue with Sean McVay. I would have McVay over Shanahan. Is my thought. he won a Super Bowl? Won a He's Super been Bowl? Two. Been mm-hmm. to two. One one. Whatever. No problem. Doug Peterson. I feel like he's underrated. To be me too. You. Love Doug. I he oh, the way Philly ended, I think, really ruins people's reputation of him. He won a Super Bowl with Nick Foles against Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. And he he's going to continue to do good things in the NFL. I'm excited mm-hmm. to see what he's going to be able to do in 2023. So honestly, I don't put the card ahead of the horse, but it's like the Jags are pretty good, right? <laughs> the AFC South's not very good. I think it might be their division for a few years. It, it really could be, and honestly. I'm okay with the list so far after kind of Mm -hmm. bashing it a little bit. I'm okay with it. So we'll we'll continue. Here's where things go wrong. Nick Sirianni, number eight. I feel like he has a very similar case to Zach Taylor. Yes. And it's, he's gone to a Super Bowl offensive coach that didn't start off great, but he got better except he handed off play calling duties. Taylor actually still calls plays, but uh, you know, he just went to the Super Bowl. So if this list, I think in my mind went, Nick Sirianni, then Zach Taylor, I'd be like, yeah, perfectly fine. They're the same tier totally coach to fine. me. Totally fine. And again, I know you mentioned it. And honestly, I start to think about that a lot when I see these lists of from other fan bases, from national people, and they're just some random thing like this quarterback is number one or this quarter. And it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, mm-hmm. none of this matters. But it's June 29th when we're recording this, and there's nothing else going on besides Taylor Swift in Cincinnati. So we are going to talk about this list. Nick Sirianni, yeah, I would, I would be totally fine because I do feel like it is very similar to Zach Taylor. All right. A little nervous about the next two, but I'm going to say it. Sean McDermott. What what has he done more than than Zach Taylor? That is interesting to me because he's also had the playoff collapses. His defense is the one. He's a defensive coach, and he's the one who's gotten whooped on his home field twice now (laughs) to lose to end his season. I I don't think I could argue him being this high, but regular season success, I guess. Cool. one thing to look at who, who cares about your regular season they were, i know when you get to the top 10 coaches like who cares about the regular season what are they doing in the playoffs because if, if zach taylor did exactly what sean mcdermott did we would be talking about zach taylor can't win the big game and and i know they didn't win the big game but overall five playoff wins in two years not i think terrible. getting spanked on your home field like that is just such an embarrassing way to go out i mean they're lucky it wasn't 40 to something like yeah should have been worse than what the outcome was. They are they are very lucky that that didn't work out or go even more in favor to the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, so yeah, Sean McDermott. I'm I'm sorry. Seems like a great guy. Obviously, has a very talented team. I'm just not buying that Sean McDermott is the better head coach over Zach Taylor. Sorry, you got to win. You you got to figure out how to get to the more AFC Championship games. You have to figure out how to get to the Super Bowl. You have the talent on both sides. He hasn't of the ball. been to an AFC Championship game. You said more AFC Championship games. Ooh, he hasn't even been I to did, one. I did say. I'm sorry, Sean McDermott. He keeps getting me... bounced in the divisional round, but he's a But he. You haven't been to any AFC guy. Championship games. I, I was trying to give you one. I was trying to give you at least <laughs> one, and you didn't even make one. Um, but no, you have all the talent in the world. They were the media darling last year. I don't feel like we're getting it as much. I do think they're picked over Cincinnati no. right now. I, no, I actually don't. I think you don't that see it? no, what I'm seeing with the Bills and my limited social media interaction seems to be people getting maybe a little bit too off of them. Like I, I'm seeing a lot of people saying like Dolphins are gonna win this division or Jets are gonna win this division. Almost more than I see Ravens and whoever winning the AFC North. I, I think the Bengals might have a little bit more respect. Really? I still think the Bills are gonna win the AFC East. I think so too. I think this is just like last year when people were trying to We've made yeah. the comparison. AFC West last year. There's going to be another good team, the Chargers. And then are the Jets good? No, I think they're better than the Broncos were last year. But are we getting a little ahead of ourselves with them? Yeah, we are. I want them to be on hard knocks because I want everything to go downhill from there. Um, I want it to be all on video, everything. I want Because the, they don't want to be on hard knocks. And I want it to happen because one of the teams have to be on it and they still don't have a team yet. And training camp starts in less than, well, yeah, less than a month. So 
yeah, I I still think the Bills and this nothing against going to the season or anything like that. Look, Sean McDermott might be able to uh, take his team to the Super Bowl this year. Might be able to go to the AFC Championship game. I just think that it's been really underwhelming. So, and he's the head coach. Uh, Brian Dayball. He's such he's such a media darling. Over Zach Taylor. Didn't he? Four? He did win Coach of the Year, right? He did. Yeah. No, but that's my whole point about Coach of the Year is it's just floor raising. Like if you have a bad team and you win some variance games and you come out on top, it's you win some close games that could have gone either way. You end up squeaking in the playoffs. Boom, you're Coach of the Year. <laughs> it's just – I don't know. It's just funny to me. I think he's probably a good coach, but he hasn't really done anything in the playoffs either. I, I'm not trying to just rag on him. He hasn't really had an opportunity with the players he had. But I just think we get so ahead of ourselves with some of these coaches. I, I just – the Brian Dabble thing, it's – He's probably good, but how good? And can he just really raise a floor? Or if he gets like a high-end quarterback or just a really good offense, can he actually take that team somewhere? We don't know. Yeah. I don't think we have any idea. They did win that playoff game. I think they were underdogs against Minnesota. So that's I don't believe in Minnesota. But Minnesota, no. they have Justin Jefferson, and that's, that's the most exciting thing about them. Yeah, pretty much. But – you know, I just think Brian Dabble is – you won't find a coach that has <laughs> that has more love with the media than him. It's just I, – I don't know what it is, but they just love him. Um, he did he did a good job. I, I think he could he, – he's probably not on my personal top ten, yeah. but he could be next year. Like, sure, sustain your success. Win, go to an NFC Championship game with Daniel Jones. Boom, I'm putting you probably into that top ten. But – getting to the division around and getting spanked by the Eagles. Uh, it's fine. And yeah, yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I guess for the most part, I would say the top of his rankings, they were okay. And I, I would, I don't have a problem with him. Everybody can, you know, disagree on the tier maybe of where they're at. Maybe a tier would be better when it comes to putting coaches in the same level. And you could say Bill Belichick and Andy Reid mm -hmm. um, are the same tier. No issue. We talked about Andy Reid on the last podcast. He's a really good head coach. Um, and it's wild because there were people who were connecting that Andy Reid had Patrick Mahomes. That's why he's good. And I'm like, no, he's well, really they did that with Bill and Tom too. He's really talented. It's um, still, it's still being done with Bill and Tom. It's like, it's proof. Bill Belichick can't coach. Yeah. And I, and yeah, that's absolutely insane and wild to me, uh, for that topic of conversation. So yeah, look, not a whole lot going on in the Bengals world, but I saw that and I just feel like Zach Taylor, um, definitely deserves more credit and you know he's so close to having at least one Lombardi right now and that's crazy to think about if he had one he he would have made the list I think just out of respect you put everybody that wins one yeah I would yeah. hope so oh look I don't know <laughs> maybe there's still one Brian Dabble over he would, him. At, he would have him at 11 <laughs> honorable mention honorable mention Zach gotta Taylor. mention this guy one a Lombardi <laughs> but I mean, yeah I mean for me I just factor in in my own personal thoughts. It's so hard to evaluate coaches in the first place mm -hmm. because what do we know? <laughs> you know, that's my first thought with coaches. It's like, what do we actually know with these coaches? But so, what do I value? I value their ability. I guess Mike McCarthy is a Super Bowl winning coach, but I, I just uh, he is one. He will not be making a top ten. <laughs> no, he, he shouldn't. No, not at all. I just thought of it as I was talking. Pete Carroll. Yes, Pete Carroll. That. He's probably in my top 10, though. Pete Carroll, because defensive coach designed the Legion of Boom. I know a lot of that's also draft luck and the GM and whatever else. But, man, you know he why? was really good for a little while. But people really thought Russell Wilson, I feel like if you let him cook, they would have had this explosive offense and been a dynasty. Who knows? You know why people are down on Pete Carroll? He's old? No, it's huh. not that it's the Super Bowl. It's a Super Bowl game. I think people will never forget. Oh, just that Marshawn Lynch didn't give him yeah. the ball. I, I still defend the idea to pass there. I don't think they chose no. the right one and they executed terribly. Yeah. But no. the idea to pass was just, I think it was second down at the time and they had one timeout. So they had to throw a pass in there or they'd have to spike the ball. And I think they thought, oh, Russell Wilson, he's not going to turn the ball over. He never turns the ball over. But then they designed a pick play on the goal line. It's like, no, not that one. Don't do that. <laughs> I'd rather you run a goal line fade. But they don't have they didn't have any receivers that were 
at all tall. So really, what was the option to pass there? I guess play action, but yeah. I, des- I defend the idea that it was okay to pass the ball there considering you're probably running your next two downs. They just called the wrong one, and then it went way downhill from there. And a great play from Malcolm Butler. Yeah, it's so wild. Uh, yeah, and yeah, I agree. Pete Carroll should have been on there. That's another coach that they missed. Um, but I really – see, here's what I get. We tell Twitter as we're recording, make sure you send your questions. We're going to do a double hunter mail bag. We start to get the questions – and we only have one more segment left. So, guys, you have to answer us when we put it out there right away in the mornings. And we'll and we'll get to your questions. Uh, but we just did two segments on Zach Taylor and Carlos Dunlap. So we appreciate <laughs> that. July is right around the corner. Uh, we'll be back with your mailbag questions next on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Feeling that Friday Eve. When you listen to this podcast, it will be Friday. And uh, let's get to our mailbag questions. Thanks for sending those. Uh, We got Scott Mylan. He says, not sure if you've already covered this, but is it just me or is there a different feeling about this offseason? Different feeling in that um, Burrow's not having something traumatic happen. Knock on wood. Knock, knock, knock. But, yeah, I, I mean, how different is this offseason from last season before the appendectomy, though? That is, I guess, my one thought. They didn't have Orlando Brown. There was certainly – well, actually, last year was probably more of an overhaul on the offensive line that we were talking about. You're right. A new guard, right. new center, new tackle. So I, I think it's pretty similar to last year's offseason, except we haven't had anything crazy stupid happen yet. And I don't believe they're going to do the Rams, Rams Bengals joint practice. At least I hope not. That image of the helmet and the swinging in the air it just made me so nervous. I think of the two, Aaron Donald just holding two helmets. Maybe it was maybe it was just him holding two. I thought I saw a helmet in the air, and I was like, "Yeah, oh, there's one of those too." I mean, they took a ton of images. What a terrible idea for those two teams! And I didn't really. I mean, besides the Super Bowl, of course, losing the Super Bowl to that team, I didn't know that was terrible blood between the two teams. But uh, yeah, that's never going to happen again. I feel like it's going to be pretty light um, when it comes to joint practices. Uh, but yeah, no, I would just I kind of agree with you. Um, it's an exciting feel. I uh, said it when we were talking about Brian Callahan, he hit his excitement level listening to him on locked on uh, Bengals. And he just sounded what, what this, what they're doing behind the scenes with this offense just sounds like they're, they're just getting started. And that's going to be exciting because there does feel like you could do more with this offense. It's exciting. You have all the playmakers in the world, uh, but it feels like they can go on an even higher level. So maybe that's what I'm feeling. And of course the excitement when a team, um, has back-to-back years of going to the AFC Championship game and one of the top teams in the AFC, you you, you feel that. Uh, Kyle says, think we know what the offense is going to bring to the field, but should we talk about this new look secondary on defense? I've My take on the secondary is going to be that it's probably going to start a little rocky. I think you're just looking at Cheeto coming off the injury, two new safeties. Uh, the communication is important in the secondary and they've got a lot of new pieces in there. What's important is that they get good throughout the season. And then by the playoffs, you're not worried about them, but I could see some busts and some issues early on. Uh, that is my first thought on the secondary. It's, it's not as talented, right? Well, I guess I'll say it. Yeah. I'll say talent. It's not as good this year. I think it's a secondary for the future, but you know, you don't have a Jesse Bates in the safety room as of now. Could Dax Hill play that good? Possibly. This is essentially his first year as a, as a safety. He didn't play any safety other than garbage time last year. So can he step in and be that good? That would be impressive. And even though I am a Nick Scott truther, Von Bell's probably a little bit better. <laughs> uh, they play different roles, but you know, it's just both safeties were probably better. And that's why they got all that money. That's now it's going to be Dax Hill, who you hope can develop into as good or better than the best of those two safeties. Um, and then Nick Scott was a value signing, and you're you're hoping Jordan Battle develops into a guy that is going to start, but I think it's going to be Nick Scott early on, if not the entire year, and you're just finding ways to get Battle onto the field. When it comes to the corner, I just think Cheeto, he's going to get better throughout the year. It's 
I watched a lot of um, what's it, Trey White for the Bills last year who had an ACL injury that he took a while to recover from. He got put on pup mm-hmm. and then he didn't come back until late in the year, but he got better as it went. You know, it's just getting into the flow of things, shaking off the rust. Like you're going to give up some plays, put those behind you. And I mean, I feel like by the postseason, he wasn't back to fully normal, but he was a pretty good corner by then i think yeah no he was he was top notch um but uh i i like that the receivers were able to score touchdowns on him <laughs> <laughs> well i think they really picked on those bills linebackers i he felt did. like in that game which everybody was trying to say uh well, wait was it joe mixon that said uh the ravens linebackers aren't as good as the bills and they that? got mad at him they got mad at him but, but then they- the Bengals destroy the bills linebackers <laughs> the division he, he said it going into the game he's like yeah i think that the ravens linebackers are better and and I honestly wasn't against it because it's just more physical when you play them and it yeah. probably was he's gonna know he's the running back so yeah and he got hammered for it and then they do- dominated them in the snow uh, and joe hadn't had himself a nice game We'll go ahead and go to Darion. He says, do you think Pratt and Logan are the best linebacking duo in the league? What makes them great together and separate as players? I think they're up there. I don't think I can just say they're the best. You look Mm -hmm. at San Francisco, Fred Warner's better than either. Just he's a monster when Mm -hmm. it comes to coverage stuff. And then they've got Dre Greenlaw as well, who I believe was up for an all pro. I don't think he's. I don't think he's insanely good, but I do think he's good enough that he balances it out enough that Fred Warner and him might make up a more positive contribution than Pratt and Wilson together. I think that Pratt and Wilson work together really well, though. Um, with Wilson, he is kind of kind of the mouthpiece of the defense and the green dot, and he does all the adjustments and all the stuff you don't see, calls the defense, makes changes, etc., he also is really good at reading quarterback intentions. And we know this from two years ago, getting turnovers, picking the ball off, has great hands, everything like that. Pratt to me is such a glue guy linebacker. And I love those types. So this is why I like Pratt more personally. He just wears so many hats for the Bengals defense. Like, yes, he plays traditional linebacker stuff and he does that. I think he does that really well now. I think it used to be an issue for him to spot drop. But now I think of that Panthers play where he got the interception. That was off a spot drop, something he struggled with before. And now he's pretty good at it. Gets to his drops. And I think he showed all year he was able to get to his drops and take things away. I think he does a really good job of matching wide receivers. He had a play where he ran with Tim Patrick down the field and broke up the ball. Uh, He also ran with Chase Claypool and Darnell Mooney before. I also think that he is the blitzer of the two and the guy that maybe will take those run through opportunities. But the part that makes me put him just a tiny bit over Wilson, in my personal rankings is when they go to what's called a penny front, which is five guys up front and then one linebacker behind it. Wilson plays that linebacker spot that they don't take Pratt off the field. The Rams, when they get to that front, they take the second linebacker off the field. The Bengals put Pratt on the edge as if he's a defensive end and just let him play the run and drop into coverage rush the passer everything and he does a good job i think that's really impressive to be able to be a good linebacker and then to also just be able to oh, i'm gonna go be a defensive end <laughs> it's just he's undersized but i'll go take on that guard i'll go take on that tackle it's very cool to me i i think he does I think he's just such a great glue guy linebacker. And I think they work really well together because Wilson can use those guys so that he can keep playing normal linebacker spot and Pratt can use Wilson so that he can go do all this other crazy stuff because he has another linebacker there that can do the important linebacker things. It's crazy because we were waiting for so long for them to have good linebackers and yeah. the guys they do. It's like, man, I hope they can figure it out and get Logan Wilson an extension. And, and it does feel like it's more next year, but Hey, if they're able to get all three of them done this offseason, that would be a huge one for this team, especially when they were able to get Jermaine Pratt for the number they brought him back with. Mm-hmm. Eric Wolchelager, Wolch- I'm so sorry if I butchered your name, but I'm going to go ahead and go to your question. He said, I never lived in Cincinnati. Season ticket holder that drives up from Florida with my son. Incredible. We're slowly learning the go-to food spots and around the city. Can you drop a list of must-visit places? You should start when you come to Cincinnati. Me? Yeah. Oh, you? wow. This is more of a question for you. My favorite spots. Yeah. I mean, obviously every time I go, I get skyline 
and I also go to the I also go to jungle gyms every time because nothing wrong with jungle gyms. What, what a cool grip! Look, we don't have that. That's such a cool place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I don't buy anything crazy. I usually buy grippos and hot sauce. <laughs> so. Whoa! I have two things of hot sauce in my fridge right now that are Skyline. Oh, nice. That's so yeah. Nice. Um, for real, not Skyline's not real food, but if you want to like. You do sit down at Skyline. <laughs> but, you make it nice. I think I think my two favorite, actually one of these restaurants, you don't sit down. My two favorite restaurants in Cincinnati that are not Cincinnati chili related that I've been to are uh, Eli's. That's over our, near the river. Mm -hmm. Great barbecue spot. And the other one I love is Island Fridays, which is kind of near the university yeah. area. Yep. Uh, Jamaican to food. So good. Yeah, for me, you can personally, take over for, for yeah, I, I'm I'm out. I mean, Ryan Geist was a very cool brewery. 50 West was very cool. 50 West is an amazing spot. And the guy is a huge Bengals fan. Uh, his name is Optimistic Bobby over on Twitter. And he's, he's oh, really OK. Clean. Bump it's it really up a little clean. bit more. 50 West. Go there. Yeah, go there. Go to 50 West. It's really good. The vibe is great. They keep mm -hmm. growing. Um, but the the food and, and everything like that, I know it's not obviously close to the stadium, but it's still in the Cincinnati area. So I recommend that. Obviously, kind of more of the formal places. Everyone's going to say Ruby's or Soto if you like Italian. Oh, sure. You know. I haven't been to Ruby's yet. It's just. You have to. Next. Here's I what know you're I doing. have to go. I tried to. <laughs> I have to convince my fiance that <laughs> we should go because every time she's like, that's a lot of money. And I'm like, it, yeah, but whatever. It sure is. It really is. But I will tell you this. You go once, you're going to be like, I've got to go back. And here's the thing. You come to, you don't come to Cincinnati every weekend. When exactly. You, you, I've, you, you make the same arguments I make. <laughs> you're like two times a year. So you're coming for the Bills game, maybe. The Bills game? Is the Bills game, I'm pretty sure I'm coming for. You need to talk her into it. Get here on a Friday. And here's my hot take. I know everybody likes Jeff Ruby's that's downtown. They just moved it over to Fountain Square. Free ad on the show, Jeff. Um, friend go to, of the show. Friend of the show. Precinct is my favorite Jeff Ruby's. And it's off Columbia Parkway. So I highly recommend you guys come here on a Friday night. Go to Precinct. You'll love the vibe. The service is absolutely amazing. And the steaks are awesome. I will say this because I'm team cheap. I get the smallest filet you can possibly get. That's like $50. <laughs> I'm like, oh, Jeff Ruby's $50 steak. Oh, there we go. I convinced my fiance. Like, you can get the fifty dollar one if you want. Ounces, you know? I'm going like steak burrow, whatever. Like, I'm going there. I don't I'm know if I'm making hundred and something. But whatever. I'm throwing my money away. You know <laughs> what? You live once. You should have one. If you're listening to the show, make sure you tell Mike that he should at least have one Jeff Ruby steak in his lifetime. So this is what you guys are gonna do. You are going to the precinct next time you're in town. You're coming that Friday. And um, you're gonna have the best time ever. But outside of all that stuff, nobody wants to go to to Jeff Ruby's before a Bengals. Maybe you do. Maybe you roll on that yeah. side. I, I don't. Um, Sometimes you can, uh, I just eat the skyline at the stadium. Eat the skyline at the stadium. Well, you now. should be Gold Star. Honestly, I'm a I'm an OTR girly now. I live over in OTR mm -hmm. in Pendleton, and um, I'm going there tomorrow. Sacred Beast is a really good vibe. They have different sandwiches and food, and and it's just really cool. Kruger's best burger in town. Maybe it's a hot take, but I recommend it. Service is great. You can get right in. Um, again, these are more OTR things. If you guys ever park in the OTR parking lots, take the streetcar down to uh, Pecor Stadium. It's free. Um, so I actually recommend going a little outside of the city, um, just a little towards the OTR area. If you guys OTR is very cool. Mm -hmm. It's so awesome. There's the so Eagle? much. I've only been to the Pittsburgh cool. one, but the Eagle's great. The Eagle post game on a Sunday is just it hits the spot after a 1 p.m game so go there you you'll love everything on the menu but yeah i, I actually kind of re recommend a little outside because i feel like it's easy to say go to the grill go to the other restaurants lager mm -hmm. house all that that's there um and nothing's wrong with it i just i recommend kind of just staying a little outside on the otr area because there's just restaurants are popping up every day so awesome that you make the trip from florida that's really cool um the way the the way this fan base is starting to grow you hear people saying i'm gonna get the six pack or the eight pack of season tickets i'm gonna fly into these games and it's awesome it's incredible um love seeing it grow and honestly i appreciate your guys's questions i know we didn't get to all of them because we extended the segment a little bit i apologize guys we went on a little we talked about Zach, Zach and food too. <laughs> <We> <laughs> that, that question took up quite a bit of time a little bit we, of space sorry guys we we definitely uh but hey if there's not a whole lot going on in the Cincinnati Bengals world, not a whole lot, except for Taylor Swift. I will say this Hamilton County and the Cincinnati Bengals, the inquirer had it today that they are going to split some 
of the money from the concert this weekend. And there is supposed to be, I think they said $92 million can be made this weekend between Taylor Swift and the Cincinnati Reds games. It's going to be crazy downtown. So think of that money. When I buy my beer at the concert tomorrow night, this is oh, going to be going to the T. Higgins, T. Higgins Joe Burrow Fund. That's where that money's going. So that, that's coming that, out that I'm kind of cheap, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, it's like, somebody put on there, they're an NFL. I can't think of who said it, but it made me laugh. He goes, uh, so what if Joe Burrow goes to the concert and his money is funding his contract? He's like, yeah. There's no way he's paying to get That's exactly that what I said. I said Joe, Burrow, Joe Burrow's coming in in his um, – his- Jim, Jim Burrow will have to pay <laughs> to get him. Jim Burrow doesn't, I mean, not, none of them. So he'll come in without, I mean, he, you don't even need a credential if you're Joe Burrow. Some of those guys, they do have like, okay. security. <laughs> Last one minute question. Yeah. <laughs> Which Bengal might have to pay to get it? <laughs> Ooh. Like how far down do you have to go? Like do all starters get in for free if they want? Or is uh, Alex Kappa having to pay to get in? Zach Taylor. Zach, Zach Taylor. Here, you know what? Zach Taylor is a man of the people. Only top 10 coaches for free, Nick. Our producer said, I will say this about Zach Taylor. He was at the Reds game the other night. My friend was there and she goes, he was sitting out in not the diamond seats or anything like that. He's just sitting out in the regular old great American ballpark. He looks like a normal person. Like, I, I don't know how to describe that, but like he looks like an everyday person. I think yep. that's one thing that he can get away with is that he can kind of go to the grocery store or do whatever. Uh, but yeah, I was thinking like, which players have to pay to get in? I think any backup probably has to pay to get in, but maybe they, they just know the codes. You have to say a player and I will too. And we'll close this out. Okay. Wow. Why is the first one to come to my mind? Drew Christman. It was. <laughs> oh no, for you too. <laughs> Sorry, Drew. You know, maybe my- the rookies. The, the rookies got to pay to get in. They don't have Charlie book. Jones. Charlie, Charlie Jones. Jones. Charlie yeah. Jones is definitely going with his girlfriend, probably, and she's a, probably a Swifty, and he's probably like, <laughs> I "Got it? How am I getting these tickets, team?" I really don't know how that impacts, or if they tell the players, "Like, look, we have this number of tickets. Here, here you go." Because Brian Callahan is going. He's, oh, like, he's okay. taking his daughter and his wife to to Taylor Swift uh, this weekend. So, um, you know, the coach they're probably getting some kind. Could of Frank deal. Pollock get in for free? Frank Pollock is a Swifty. He's going to be handing out friendship bracelets. <laughs> friendship bracelets. <laughs> what would Frank Pollock's? Oh, I already know. What would Frank Pollock's friendship bracelet say? Oh, just say it. I don't know. Glass eater. Glass eater. Okay. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> you guys can tell we're at the end of our podcast now. Look, none of that may happen, and that was no offense to Drew Christman. Look, they might know him. He's everywhere now. He does have the codes for sure. I see those videos. Do you see how he makes it really fast with his edit? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> it looks like he presses two buttons. Yeah. I think he cuts out some of them. No, and and I will say this really quickly. You mentioned Drew Christman. We're going to really wrap this podcast up. Amazing stuff that he's doing right now mm-hmm. uh, with DoorDash. And, you know, it was all he was working out his legs um, as a punter right now. I know everything's going to happen behind the scenes. Who's going to be the punter? What's going to happen with Drew Christman? And just incredible work. Really love it on social media. Sometimes you see a lot of negative out there. And Drew is doing incredible things uh, with DoorDash and, and helping people in need. And I think it's awesome. And I love seeing it every day. I hope he continues his videos uh, so we can see the great work he's doing. So hopefully he's going to Taylor for free. <laughs> that's, all, that's how I end DoorDash that. is getting them in. You better. Uh, all right. Well, fun stuff. And, and next week we're only going to be. Next week, we're three weeks away from training camp, which is uh, really fun to talk about. We'll get there next week and everything and all your Twitter questions. Mike's taking a break, but I'm going to mention it every podcast. You should still go to All Bengals, look at all of his rookie recaps and uh, Bengals work, and then over on Twitter, Bengals underscore Sands. You can follow me at Alan D.S. Patterson. Thank you for listening to It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati.